me first uh, thank uh, CWS. I still say WSP in my mind, so that's obviously old history now. Um, for inviting me to uh, be part of your annual lecture series. Um, I, I don't know and whether I'm the most appropriate person to be delivering this lecture at all. Um, and so with some trepidation that in fact I'm going to be presenting some ideas which as you will see are very much in the process and very much in the mode of rethinking things that I thought I knew. And the only reason I thought, yes, I would try this out here, uh, I have presented some of these ideas before, the, the, over the past few years, is precisely because I can't think of a better audience and uh, a more really conducive space within which to open up issues which I think need to be questioned uh, in order for us to think ahead. Okay, so I call this um, the touchstone of sexual violence, 2013-18, rewriting histories of the present in the Me Too era. Uh, well over 20 years ago, in the early 1990s, in a pioneering essay, Problems for a Contemporary Theory of Gender, Susie Paro and Vijasmi Niranjana began provocatively with the statement, Suddenly women are everywhere. The arguments of that essay chose to problematize some of the ways in which the new woman, as they put it, sometimes even portrayed as a feminist subject, was being deployed in the most significant events of the 1990s. This new subject could be found in the anti monday agitations against the implementation of reservations for the other backward castes in government services, the promotion of new long-acting contraceptives in family planning programs for women's empowerment by international agencies, the emergence of a militant female figure in the women's wing of the RSS during the late 1980s, and in accounts of the village women leading the anti arab struggles in coastal Andhra Pradesh in the early 90s. A whole generation has since elapsed and we are now well into the 21st century. In these intervening decades, feminism, taken as a shorthand for the movement for women's rights, has truly come of age. The clearest sign of this is the widespread use of the term feminism itself, which not so long ago was treated rather gingerly or else avoided altogether, with women or gender being more frequently used. Today, in spite of being up against a state formation that is the most hostile to gender equality and social justice <coughs> in the history of India, or perhaps precisely because of it, there is a renewed urgency to speak up from identifiably feminist perspectives. Thus, feminist voices have been speaking out, whether it be against global militarization, the ravages of neoliberal development, the hierarchies of caste, the disenfranchisement of minorities, the exclusions of disability or queer subjectivities. In the midst of this kind of renewal of our feminist politics, it might seem rather odd to raise questions about it. I take this perverse course in the hope of clarifying for myself what our collective insights and blindnesses have been in the recent past. The main target of my questioning, which has had to double back on itself to make changes and corrections, is the visible centrality of sexual violence in contemporary feminist politics. Just as Paolo and Niranjana once proclaimed in a critical rather than celebrated tone that women are suddenly everywhere, more than two decades later, I am tempted to say that suddenly sexual violence is everywhere. It is being recognized and called out in buses and on the street, in corporate boardrooms and university departments, in hostels and homes, in the badlands of a state like Haryana, as much as in well-to-do metropolitan India. The list of places where it is gaining visit today seems truly unending, from the violation of small children, mature adults, transgenders and sexual minorities. If violence, or more precisely sexual harassment, has become something of a touchstone for the present, it is surely a very peculiar one. After all, repeated encounters with a familiar problem ought to, make, ought to provide one with a better grasp of things, not make matters harder. But as I hope to demonstrate, recent events have forced me to revisit what I thought I knew. Much of what follows moves forwards and backwards between 2013 and the present, precisely because successive moments have called into question existing frames of reference and thinking about violence. 
In particular, the still unfolding Me Too era has provided some clues for the more intractable problems besetting women in India today. So what is new about sexual violence today? The campaign against gender violence was one of the crucial founding moments in the history of the contemporary women's movement and was followed by decades of campaigns and legal reforms. Given its status as an inaugural issue, therefore, the first question to ask is what is new about the current preoccupation with sexual violence both within the movement and in public discourses more broadly. Why am I claiming a special significance for the struggles against sexual violence today when they are, after all, only a culmination of all that has preceded it? It is broadly agreed that for reasons that we may not fully grasp, the gang rape of December 16, 2012 produced mass protests, and not just in the city of Delhi, but in several places, both large and small, that were unprecedented in scope and caught the attention of the state, the media, and the global public as never before. The horrific and fatal nature of the gang rape undoubtedly played a large part in the national and international outcry that followed. Responses include the setting up of the Justice Burma Committee and the rapid enactments of the Criminal Amendment Act of 2013 and the Sexual Access to Workplace Act of 2013. Issues of sexual violence were brought into the very mainstream of public life in a way that decades of agitation had not been able to achieve. It also turned India and its rape capital, Delhi, into a kind of state of exception on the world stage, provoking varied first world responses towards the plight of Indian women. The setting up of a special gender task force at Harvard to, to provide us with legal aid and Leslie Arvin's controversial film, India's Daughter, evoked comparisons to Catherine Mayo and the colonial civilizing mission. However, what made its aftermath so remarkable was that fresh directions and insights were gained by going against the common sense perceptions promoted by the Delhi rape case. Indeed, the so-called Nirbhaya case came dangerously close to cementing the hold of two popular myths. First, that the greatest danger to women lay in the stranger lurking in the streets after nightfall, and second, that the only way to curb such crimes was through the death penalty. To begin with, there was a qualitative difference in the forms of the protest and its feminist leadership. This difference was largely inspired, I suspect, by the repositioning of questions of sexuality since the 1990s. It was remarkable that the December 2012 protests did not only demand justice and an end to victimization, they also asserted women's right to desire, to freedom and autonomy, and spoke out in the language of sexual rights. For every banner calling for death to the rapist, there were others proclaiming, don't ask me where I was last night, my dress is not a yes. The frequent cry of Azadi in the many gatherings that followed was not a slogan one had heard in prior mobilizations against rape. Another difference was in the exemplary path-breaking research done at this time, in contrast to the 1980s and 90s, when there was precious little. Activists and scholars began to examine sources of data, such as that provided by the National Crimes Records Bureau. I have to confess that before this time, I did not know that 98% of all the rape FIRs lodged in the police stations, the perpetrator was known to the victim. If this was the official record, what of the actual situation on the ground about which one can only speculate, given all the barriers against reporting rapes by someone known or in a position of power? The studies and reports of this period upset widespread assumptions about rape and violence. Two examples stand out. The investigations of Rukmini Srinivasan for the Hindu newspaper in Delhi revealed that for many years, the largest category of rape cases registered in Delhi come under the category of kidnapping and abduction. In fact, this, these are almost invariably cases against boys in eloping young couples registered by the parents of the girl, hence these were not really cases of rape at all. A study conducted by the organization Machis in Mumbai highlighted the prevalence of cases of incest by fathers in broken families in a city like Mumbai. And the fact that this was not known, that, and, and the fact that it was not known is that such cases were more numerous than cases of stranger rape. Thus, the Delhi gang rape stimulated research and human insights precisely because it was a perfect case of stranger rape that fitted only too well with the stereotype that needed to be dislodged. One of its less noticed effects was that it crowded out the media attention to the shocking avalanche of rapes of Dalit girls and women in the neighboring state of Haryana that were happening around the same time. On the surface, these were cases of young school or college going girls aspiring for a better future for themselves 
thereby inviting comparison to Jyoti Singh, the daily victim of December 2012. But the vital difference was that the respective social status of the victim and perpetrator were reversed in the Haryana cases. Jyoti Singh may have been from the lower, was a lower middle class woman training to become a professional career as a therapist. Her attackers were members of the urban precariat, basically social trash. By contrast, in neighboring semi-urban Haryana, girls and women from the lowest and most vulnerable castes were being raped by young men from their own neighborhoods who were mostly from the locally dominant jar caste, capable of wielding influence where it mattered. Moreover, the aspiration for upward mobility implicit in the Dalit girls' quest for education ran against the grain of caste society. <coughs> Thus, despite their surface similarity and their contiguity in time and space, the Delhi and Haryana rapes were worlds apart. It was these intersectionalities which conspired to make the whole question of justice so elusive in Haryana compared to the swiftness with which it seemed to be achieved in Delhi. So there is no doubt that much was being learned. 2013 spawned new movements among the youth and especially among students. Examples include Hyderabad for Feminism, an online forum for combative violence and harassment in that city. The wide loyalty groups that demanded a new relation to public urban spaces and a redefinition of what counts as safety and of course the internet movement in Delhi's colleges and universities calling for an end to discrimination in women's hostels. Transgender groups in cities like Hyderabad, Bengaluru and Chennai raised the curtain on the extent of the everyday sexual violence and discrimination that was subjected to by the police. Needless to add, this is only a very incomplete initial list. So this was clearly a moment of creative upsurge, public outcry and accountability and of long-awaited legal reform. Despite this, however, I also developed a sense of disquiet, especially in a context where much of the energy of this movement <clears throat> came from university and college students. The powerful responses to harassment and violence engendered by this movement also appeared at the same time to have the disabling effect of obscuring the constitutive context shaping young people's and especially young women's destinies. Our initial response as feminists had been to deny the exceptional status according to sexual violence in India by a sensation-seeking media, both local and global. However, I also believe that India was indeed exceptional, though for reasons that were deeper and stranger. While it is yet to be elaborated and justified, my basic argument is that what makes India exceptional is the paradoxical juxtaposition of near gender parity in access to higher education and a very low proportion of women in any kind of gainful employment. Nowhere else in the world is this the case. And yet, this unique predicament has somehow failed to attract public attention. Indeed, even the women's movement has not cared enough to make this a political issue. Where is the ire, if not rage, over the, these kinds of constitutive contexts within which violence is so endemic? Let me lay out my misgivings in relation to higher education, where, or so I thought, till Me Too came to India in 2017, issues <coughs> of sexual harassment had been sufficiently scrutinized and politicized. I was brought into a direct relationship with this situation when the UGC set up a task force in January 2013 as an immediate response to the Delhi gang rape to review the existing arrangements that have been put in place on the campuses to ensure the freedom, safety and security of girls and women in particular and of the entire youth in general. I'm quoting from the <coughs> TOR that we received. The task force was given the, op the opportunity to investigate into how universities were tackling sexual harassment and providing gender sensitization, the results of which came out in the form of the UGC report suction. Open forums were conducted in a number of universities and a broader glimpse of the state of affairs in many more institutions was obtained by sending out questionnaires to all the constituent colleges and universities under the UGC's jurisdiction. If one had to sum up the findings as briefly as possible, they would be thus. The subject of sexual harassment was at best a matter of considerable confusion and more frequently one of outright denial, especially among administrators and teachers while the weakest aspect of India's institutions of higher education turned out to be their lack of gender sensitivity. The task force heard over and over again about the pervasive vulnerability to forms of sexual harassment that constituted the everyday life of women students on campuses. It was exacerbated by the lack of basic facilities, public 
transport, lighting, hospital accommodation, healthcare, and counseling on the one hand, and, compound, um, and compounded it <coughs> when gender was reinforced by other structures of discrimination and disadvantage, by rural location, caste, class, minority status, disability, and sexuality, to name a few. In peri urban and rural areas, there were women students who could only get to college by tractor. But even in the heart of India's metros, the lack of public transport in a sprawling campus made many women <coughs> dependent on male students for their daily, for their little daily needs, who then expected favors in return in a classic quid pro quo mode. Women students wearing a hijab received frequent comments and taunts, while those from the states of the Northeast were subjected to propositioning should they venture out for a walk in the evenings. Very few members of higher education institutions took the need for gender sensitization seriously, even though it is arguably the most critical in terms of creating a conducive atmosphere on campus in relation to gender equality and freedom from harassment. Moreover, given the heterogeneous nature of student populations, who not only study but often live together for many years, it was not just experience of discrimination but different ideas about appropriate behavior that created confusion and alienation among students. <coughs> The university or college, precisely because their purpose is education, should have been places that are especially well placed to think further about equality, to enable students to take risks and experiment, to learn how to not just tolerate but live well with others, who are different, whether socially, economically, in terms of religion, caste, sexual, or sexual orientation, or ability. The suction report attempted to capture the views of students who strongly and repeatedly articulated that a university, and I'm quoting, should help women transition from the protective atmosphere of the home into a real life situation where she had to be independent. The greatest obstacle to gender sensitization was the administrative approach for dealing with the presence of significant numbers of women students, namely protectionism and policing. In the wake of the Delhi Gangway, while students took out marches and held vigils for greater freedom and justice, Authorities in many parts of the country responded by making their rules for women students even more stringent than they were before the incident. Hostel timings were curtailed and night outs cancelled. Most poignant of all was the exposure of the most effective measure for silencing students. Especially in undergraduate colleges and privately managed institutions, there appeared to be a kind of unspoken pact between the administration and parents, whereby discriminatory rules had to be tolerated if not respected even if they were oriented towards blaming the victim. If students spoke, spoke up or acted against such rules, the result could very be one of being asked to leave. Here again, it was only too obvious as to which students would be most vulnerable to this kind of threat. Those already battling convention-bound family backgrounds with limited economic resources, coming from marginal communities and locations. In such a situation, several students said that it would be better to quietly endure the daily humiliations and constraints than to risk having to give up these precious few years. <clears throat> the suction report was produced a year after the Delhi Gangway and then accepted as guidelines by the UGC. It had been hoped that these would therefore be the basis for a new set of regulations to deal with sexual harassment on campuses. Regulations were indeed created in 2016 by a new team and with the involvement of several government ministries. But unfortunately, their strong focus on internal complaints committees did not appear to carry much of the spirit of the suction report forward. Such disappointment apart, my concern in those years was also to draw attention to what I perceived to be as critical for students and their futures. In all the turmoil, one of the most remarkable facets of higher education was either being taken for granted or bypassed altogether. Namely, the gendered aspects of the democratization of the student body at a time of unprecedented expansion and privatization. So I'm now going to say something briefly about this, uh, I don't know, taken for granted, gender parity in higher education. To put this unique moment in the history of higher education in some perspective, <coughs> on the eve of independence, there were approximately one lakh students enrolled in the nation's colleges and universities, at a time when all universities were state-run and charged practically no fees. According to the All India Survey of Higher Education report, this number stood at a staggering 34 million in 2015-16, with over 1 lakh enrolled at the PhD level alone. India now has the largest system of higher education in the world, 
and the second largest in terms of the sheer number of students enrolled. But hear this, just 10% of students at the time of independence were women. Yet by the year 2000, this figure had jumped to 40% and by 2015 had reached its way further upwards to 46.2. <clears throat> Being an average number covering every kind of institution that offers a degree after class 12, this figure hides the unevennesses of female enrollment, especially, of course, the continued male bias in institutions of national importance, which include your prestigious IITs and IIMs, BTEC and so on, and certain kinds of private universities. But one would be quite wrong to think that young women were simply crowding into the countless but relatively small B.A. colleges and other teacher training shops that had mushroomed all across the country. There was no getting away from the overall fact that what a few decades ago was still an elite male bastion had decisively given way to a situation close to gender parity when it came to students. In no other public institutional space where gender inequalities are otherwise so rife, is there anything remotely like this kind of gender parity? This unprecedented entry of women into India's colleges and universities was happening alongside democratization of access on other fronts as well. Thanks in large part to the implementation of reservations, we now have significant numbers of scheduled castes, other backward classes, and some scheduled tribes. Other groups are not as well represented, such as Muslims and other minorities. But, and this does leave upper caste overrepresented in terms of proportions. However, from, from the purposes that I want to share with you here, much more, we, though we need to say much more about what kind of presence this means and what kind of inclusion uh, this, is, this in fact uh, uh, implies, um, we do also need to recognize that even those, and let me also add those who don't show up in government statistics, people with disabilities, sexual minorities, all of whom have now more presence on our campuses, cutting through each and every group, whether it be the underrepresented Muslims, <coughs> whether it be the better represented Shedding castes and, and OBCs, cutting through all these developments, there has been a growing presence of near parity of women in every group. How should we view this? Was this simply a normal process as families, families aspire for upward mobility for daughters as well as sons? Or could there be something more potentially revolutionary in the making? These were the kinds of questions that I felt needed to be posed alongside the high visibility being accorded to the pervasiveness of sexual harassment on campuses. The touchstone of sexual harassment appeared to be the only way for students and even the UGC to stake out a hope for making young women's lives a generally more fulfilling and less humiliating experience. Women were claiming the space of higher education where they wished to transit from the protected sphere of the home to that of creating but was this in fact the case? What happens afterwards? So this brings me to the crisis of employment. The other half of my narrative. While many administrators think of it as a sort of crash for young adults, and some despairing students refer to their years in it as time pass, Indian higher education has nevertheless managed to become a unique bubble of relative gender parity. But India's workplaces present a starkly different picture. <coughs> Since the 1970s, the burden of many scholars and activists in India has been to show that our data sets on women's work are fundamentally misleading. Women are engaged in productive economic work of all kinds, but our national accounting systems are unable to capture the measures. With a strong focus on rural in India, where the majority of the population still resides, decades of analysis, especially among development economists, have gone to show how much work, including productive labor beyond conventional notions of housework, is being undertaken by women, <clears throat> but without acknowledgement. Already by the early 1990s, major international bodies like the World Bank were devising their pictures with announcements to the effect that if all the labor were counted, women worked longer and harder than men, but with fewer returns to their labor. At the same time, other scholars and feminists were arguing that this did not resolve the huge gap that is recorded between men and women in India's overall workforce, especially in urban areas. After all is said and done, not to put too fine a point on it, India has one of the lowest work participation rates in the world. The only countries worse than India are in West Asia, by the way. And this fact is only now gaining a little bit of traction. When it comes to recent trends, some speak of an overall stagnation in women's work, others notice levels of volatility, 
oscillating nonetheless around the very low average, especially in the realm of field work, where official figures, that is NSS figures, are 15, 15.15%. These low rates coincide with the time when India has witnessed the highest growth rates in its economy and where a certain common sense would have one belief that India lives in a time of unprecedented job opportunities. But what the data in fact was saying is that the contemporary economic regime is one where the vast majority of all women, however long and hard many of them may be working, at home, on farms, in artisanal, other productive industrial contexts, in the new service industries, are effectively living in relationships of dependency, fundamentally attached to households, since they are engaged in some form or the other, most of the time, of unpaid family work. These relations of dependency, by initially those of a daughter, are subsequently invariably structured by marriage. And from what we know about the lack of any effective implementation of property rights for those with land, assets, or any other forms of capital, implying, in other words, the negligible presence of women as employers, this means registering the enormity of such dependency and its wider ramifications for any discussion of women's chances for autonomy in India, including most definitively <coughs> freedom from sexual harassment and violence. Furthermore, there is also a distinct and persistent class and caste dimension to women's paid and unpaid work, which is playing a significant role in structuring India's labor markets. While a proper account is not something I can handle here, the few issues that stand out are all disturbing. Once the differences between men and women's labor situations are further disaggregated, it becomes evident that there has been an overall intensification of inequalities between women, one that aligns with their scheduled tribe, scheduled caste, OBC, and Muslim and upper caste status. Thus, for instance, the last round of the National Sample Survey for 2011-12 reveals that in a situation of overall decline in female, in female employment, STs, SCs, and OBCs in that order have been the biggest losers and that too in a context where they were already marginalized. A very small proportion of upper caste women, especially in urban India, have on the other hand found a few on clubs, such that their relative privilege in social and educational terms translates into cornering not just the more traditional fields of education, but the hyper-visible ones of finance, real estate and the media. This means that labor markets that are supposedly neutral are actually places where both stigma and discrimination arrive. To recap, the shock, to recap the shocking facts, barely 15% of women in India have any kind of paid work. And this is a figure that has been stagnating, if not declining, in recent years. The very years of the highest levels of economic growth the high, that this country has ever seen. The vast bulk of employed women are working in stagnant agriculture and a small proportion in rural, in urban India, with primary school teaching and paid domestic work being the largest concentration of urban female workers. This meant that while more and more women were indeed gaining entry into higher education as never before, declining proportions of these women would find employment once they left, however accomplished and well-educated they might be, and how much they may have invested in their education. So I hope you're getting the drift of my argument so far. In the midst of all the clamor for freedom from violence that characterized the years following the Delhi Gangway, I wish to see as much focus on the context shaping young people's and especially young women's futures. Enough talk about violence, I thought to myself, or sometimes I said out loud, even though informal conversations with students and, in, and women's groups claimed otherwise. Too much was still being left unsaid, they told me repeatedly. So now I come to my final section, the lens of Me Too in India. Then came the Me Too movement of 2017, which took everyone by surprise. Unlike the shocked international finger pointing of unlike, unlike the shocked international finger pointing of December 2012, in 2017 India was not quarantined in a state of exception. The voices of the Me Too survivors were bearing testimony to the ubiquity of sexual harassment and violence in a country like the US. Suddenly available was not just a common language of breaking the silence and gaining global credibility but also ways of telling. Varied forms of bearing witness, from personal testimonies to anonymous lists of harassers, cascaded from Hollywood, the American media, and to a lesser degree, US academia, in an escalating, expanded spiral that went viral across the global employment 
would ultimately gain some public attention. The unexpected lesson here is not only that questions surrounding sexual harassment and violence have not been exhausted, but they may also further our understanding about what makes the situation even in our context so difficult to address today. So I now have a set of questions with which I want to conclude. The first set of questions pertain to the critical presence of a new generation. Pretty Lucos has offered Karl Mannheim's conception of fresh contact to look at change across generations in the US. And I'm quoting from her, Mannheim highlighted the special force and potential of young people as a cohort on the verge of adulthood, undergoing fresh contact with their inherited traditions in the wake of the events that define their age. Close quote. Lucos suggests that for the US context, that is, that Lucos suggests for the US context, that it is the changing <coughs> sexual politics of the times that has made younger parents leading me too, who have grown up in a sexually permissive, if not sex-saturated world, draw on exploitation and victimhood that an older generation had become quite wary of. I do not wish to suggest that this is true of our world too. We lack a good description of how much things have changed since the 1990s when sexuality entered public life and movement politics in India. But many millennials are raising doubts of their own about how the desire for greater sexual freedom in repressive contexts like ours has had the effect of making sex positivism into an imperative, but with less than liberatory outcomes. In particular, what was claimed to be a progressive attitude from men, especially in heterosexual relations, has all too often turned into an experience of violation that is very hard to acknowledge, let alone name, and so much more so for anyone whose vulnerability is compounded along other axes of discrimination. For a generation such as my own, that allied with sexuality movements, sex positivity appeared as an unquestioned advance, or even in some, some views, as a counter to violence. This way of thinking stands challenged today. A second set of questions arises in the context of the university. What kind of workplace is the university? And how should one characterize the relationship between faculty and students who are not to each other as employer is to employee? While everyone may acknowledge the power differential between teacher and student, there is much more at stake. By virtue of being a relationship of learning and influence, sometimes profoundly so, the pedagogic dimensions of the relationship extend much further. This can make the institutional culture of universities quite different from that of modern workplaces. Paradoxically, in an effort to capture the ties that bind students to their teachers, commentators have described universities across the world as more feudal than capitalist. And I believe this could be even more true of the situation here. In such situations, the sexual politics of teacher-student relations become all the more difficult to address. The near parity in gender terms among the student population that I referred to earlier contrasts sharply with the social composition of faculty who are overwhelmingly male and upper caste. One might therefore now begin to discern the specific vulnerabilities of students in the Me Too era in India. In spite of universities having been the site of so much mobilizing against sexual harassment and for so long, it has been that much harder to call out harassers among faculty than in other workplaces where some very famous men have been brought low. This brings me to my third set of questions. The very new visibility of some workplaces as sites of sexual harassment. Interestingly, these have not been the more familiar traditional ones, but those such as the media and entertainment industries, where a critical mass of women is barely a generation old. We already have accounts from and lively debates among journalists of different generations that attest to this new situation. What has made it possible for this generation of women holding jobs in male-dominated work cultures to speak up as some of them have? Questions have been raised about the relative privilege of these Me Too voices in terms of class and caste. But one should be careful not to generalize. In the case of the Telugu film industry, it was women at the bottom of the pyramid who raised their voices, combining economic exploitation and sexual harassment with discrimination based on caste and colorism. Moreover, high-profile support in some quarters has gone hand-in-hand hand with backlash, denial, and forced retractions. So the paradox becomes even harder to grasp. The very time 
where the vast majority of women are condemned to relations of financial and economic dependency on men, has also become the time when sexual violation is being named in unprecedented ways and men are being called to account. In her recent book, Fortunes of Feminism, From State-Managed Capitalism to Neoliberal Crisis, <coughs> Nancy Fraser has raised some provocative questions about the coincidence of the prospering of second-wave feminism in the era of neoliberalism in Western societies. Was there some perverse, subterranean, elective affinity between them, she asked? Rather than her worry about the heightened emphasis on identity politics at the cost of critiques of capitalism, I am concerned about the considerable focus on sexual violence and harassment that is presently unfolding. Curiously, this appears to be a genuinely global moment, <clears throat> one that is bringing together countries as far apart as India and the US. Neoliberalism in India has taken the road of jobless growth in a context of very low, if not declining, decent work opportunities for women, along with rising rates of access to higher education. As we have seen, the form within which experiences of sexual violence can be named are being shaped by the very ways in which a new generation is inhabiting these worlds of education and work. So it is not enough then to take the easy route of questioning the relative ease with which liberal notions of individual perpetrators can find their place, while more structural problems do not. It is also not enough to evoke the cunning of history, as the phrase seems to be. Rather, we may have to recognize the time and place of politics, where new voices will be crafting a language for struggle in a historical moment that is yet unfolding. Thank you.